Hello, hello, and welcome. I'm Jesse Robertson from the website jessierobertson.com, and in today's painting afternoon, we're going to paint this fun honeybee full of vibrant colors and textures. Now, I can see your comments just off to the left. I see some people are painting along with me live, and others are going to catch on the replay. We'll go over our supplies in just a minute, but I wanted to introduce myself if we have never painted together before. I'm Jessie Robertson from the website jessierobertson.com and I do two free live painting tutorials every weekend. So we go live once or twice a month here from our YouTube channel. I also go live from our Facebook page and you can watch all of my live tutorials over on my website, website which I'll link to in the description. All of my videos are free for seven days for you to enjoy because everything should be free for a little while. We all need a little something free and fun and creative. Okay, it is almost 3 p.m. so let's start talking about supplies for our projects today. Now I've painted this little bee just on a piece of watercolor paper and I'm using a size 9 by 12 inches but I've painted this painting quite large on large paper and I also used to teach this tutorial on canvas. So if anyone is using canvas today, please feel free to use canvas. You're going to do it in the same way on the raw canvas when we do this fun staining to get some texture in the background. It works the same way on canvas just by making our paint really, really runny. If you're curious about painting on paper, I did make a whole video about that. I love painting on paper. It is a little bit different though. So today I'm using this fluid watercolor paper. It is 140 pounds. So I'm using a paper that's nice and heavy so it won't wrinkle too much. Any paper that's designed for acrylic paint or watercolor is going to handle water uh, for these kind of techniques really, really well. Once you've found yourself something to paint on, you're going to need some paints. Today we will be using a few colors, a nice bright red, I'm using warm medium yellow, purple like dioxazine purple or prism violet. We'll be using a small amount of phthalo blue for creating periwinkle and if you want to get abstract with your wing color and do them teal like me, we'll also be using a little bit of black. The way we pour our paints for this kind of technique is important. So oftentimes I work on big flat surfaces like glass or freezer paper. But we're going to make really, really runny paint. So I'm using a paper plate today so that it kind of cradles my paints a little bit more and it's not quite as messy. Many palettes come with divots and those are great as well. I also want you to pour your background colors, red, yellow, purple, blue, and some white on a separate palette. And then we'll put our B, our B colors on another palette just because this paint, this paint palette is going to get really, really juicy and messy and it will ruin our other paint. So you can just pour your paint while we're waiting for the background to dry. And if you want to see the colors we use for the bee, I just poured out a few blobs of yellow, purple, blue, black, and a little bit of white. And we'll talk about that again. When it comes time to do the bee, I would like us to spend at least half an hour on the staining technique, at least half an hour on the stencil technique, and then we'll have a, a, a nice amount of time for drawing our bee and then painting our bee. So these are the colors we'll be using. For brushes today, I'm using my favorite set, which includes a nice big number 12 flat brush. This is a big rectangular brush. It's about half an inch, or it's about an, whole, an entire inch. It's about an inch wide. Our number eight filbert brush, I want us to use the number six bright brush. This amazing square brush is fantastic. Two little detail brushes. These brushes are called round brushes. The big one is a number six round and the little guy there is a tiny little number one round. I just opened a new one today because I, I left my other one in paint and I didn't put it in the water and I, I ruined it. It got hard. Last but not least, a great brush for our bee and getting some of the fuzz is a small quarter inch flat brush or bright brush or any quarter inch square shaped brush. It could be a chisel blender, a flat, just any nice quarter, quarter inch 
flat brush is going to be fantastic for when we pull on the fuzz in our bee here so it fits really nicely especially on this size of substrate if you're going to be working on something larger just use larger versions of the brushes that we'll be using today we will be using a nice big old amount of water today so have your water close by mine's just right here off to the side you'll also want to have something to draw on your bee you could either use any regular pencil or if you have a white chalk or charcoal pencil or a watercolor pencil, these are really nice because you don't have to erase them. Both watercolor pencils and chalk pencils can be just wiped away with a damp napkin. So you'll want something to draw with. And of course, to create our pattern, I'm going to be demonstrating in this tutorial how to use uh, a stencil to create our pattern. So it doesn't matter the size, big or small, it just has a bit of a different look to it. I'm going to demonstrate a stencil today, but I did put out a video. I know a lot of you just couldn't get a hold of stencils or um, you don't have money for your st a stencil at the moment. You're not sure if you're going to use it, so you didn't want to commit. I had just put a tutorial on the YouTube page for how to get a very similar pattern with bubble wrap. We'll not be covering bubble wrap in this tutorial, but please feel free to just refer back to that video if you want to play with this technique. It's really quite fun and doesn't it, it would work, work so well with this little bee. So bubble wrap or a stencil. And last but not least, I want you to have a blow dryer handy dandy if you have one. I enjoy blowing water around on paper. It creates in canvas too, it creates some of these fun drips but you don't have to have it if you want to drip it by hand. I just like to use the blow dryer for tutorials because it speeds things up a little bit uh, for me. So have a blow dryer handy if you have it. And then of course some paper towels. We will be using paper towels today for drying and cleaning off our brushes, but also when we're working with really wet paint, Sometimes you might want to lift an area of paint, so using a dry or, or a damp paper towel can be quite helpful when we want to remove some of the staining that we've done. Okay, that's it for supplies. Let's launch right into our tutorials today. I see some friendly people over in chat. Maureen, hello. I see Jenny, hello. Excellent. I see Jeannie's here and Debbie and Penny. Okay guys, let's go ahead and put a B on it. We're gonna begin our painting today by just creating a field of color in the background of our canvas. And our canvas today is paper. You can leave your paper free like this or you could tape it down if you want it a little bit more sturdy with some painter's tape. So if you wanna tape it down, it's gonna be a bit more in the same spot for you the whole time. So let's go ahead and start our staining. I like to go really, really slow with this and I like to wet my entire paper before I go ahead and start adding the color. So I'm gonna dip my largest brush, my number 12 flat in some water and let's just give a generous coat of water onto our paper. If you're not accustomed to working with paper, it's gonna curl for you a little bit and if that's something that um, you don't like, you can always tape it down. I usually just push it, push it down with my hand. Now the bigger and heavier your paper, the less it's going to curl. I find with this 140 pound one, it just kind of arcs. It doesn't actually warp like some of the um, lighter weight papers do. So let's get our paper nice and juicy, a whole coat. And don't worry about some curling, this is just naturally. Your paper will flatten out as it dries. And this is the exact same paper. I didn't even press this under books, and as you can see, it, it dried really quite flat. I really love working on watercolor paper. Okay, once we wet our entire paper, or canvas, the same if you're using canvas, we're gonna go ahead and we're going to start pulling in our colors. We're also gonna make those juicy. I like to keep this drippy pattern really, really soft. We can always brighten it later. So we may wanna to switch to a smaller brush for pulling on our color, like our number eight filbert or our number six bright brush. I like to start with some yellow, and I do a gradation from yellow up until pink. 
I didn't actually add the purple until later on in this particular project. So I'm going to also add a bunch of water to my yellow paint here, not just a little. And I'm going to go just on the corner here. I'm pulling the smallest bit of pigment in and I'm going to keep this really, really runny using my, my bright brush just to create a big pool of yellow paint. You don't have to do exactly what I'm doing for this. Staining paper gives it very much like a watercolor feel and you can get quite creative with this. So because I've wet the whole page, when you're working with wet on wet like this, whether it's acrylic or watercolor, the paint will follow the water. So our paint will essentially want to travel all over our page and you can watch it as it starts to bleed out. Put a little bit on, then go just into your water and soften it out. Give it a second, watch how it bleeds out. You can do fun things, like if you just put a little circle of water on your, on your watercolor paper, your paint will actually stay where you put it. You could try things like lifting it up and dripping it down. And if you don't like where it pools at the edge, that's where the paper towel comes in handy and you can, you can wipe it. But let's travel up a little bit. Adding lots of water. Don't be afraid to get this really wet. I usually like to keep a bit of a border in some spots. Keep it light and soft. And if there's any point where you want to remove a little bit of color, you can just take your napkin and as long as it's still wet, you can kind of soften the edge by wiping it a little bit. So having these can be really nice just for rubbing or softening. The next thing I'm going to be doing is rinsing off my brush and I'm going to do the same thing now with the red. So I'm going to rinse the yellow off and of course where they meet we'll get some fabulous orange colors. So you know this is really see-through. This is just a little bit of paint and a lot of it of water and it's still going to be quite, look how thin, I hope that registers on camera just how little pigment I pulled in, like I barely touched it. So once we have our watery red, we can do the same thing. And if you want to see something fun you can do with your blow dryer, I can come in, I'm going to use a bigger brush like my Filbert. I'm going to grab really, really runny red and I'm going to put it right here. I'm going to put it right here. My paper's already flattening out as it dries. Mm -hmm. And then we could like blow it around. It's going to be loud for a second. Ready? Do not have to use a blow dryer. You can control the drip drips by lifting it around, but this just gets really wonderful different patterns. It's just a different pattern. I've done many of these paintings without using the blow dryer, but I just wanted to show you how that could look. And let's just zone into this part for a little while. I like to keep this a little bit on the softer side of color and then really build it up with our, with our honeycomb. You can mix in between colors as well. So if you wanted to get some really bright orange, you could take some of your liquidy yellow and mix it with some of your liquidy red. You could actually physically paint in some of your oranges. I think these golden colors look so nice with the bee. Now if your paper has dried, you have to push it around with your brush and your water for it to be where you want it to B. And I want to show you one more thing, which is mixing pastel versions of our colors. You can mix pastel versions with the white. So if you wanted to, instead of just using see-through water, get a lighter pink by instead mixing white directly into it. 
and then bleeding that out, it's just it's going to be not as vibrant. So because this is just pure red saturated, it reads as pink, almost neon pink. Whereas this, as we saturate it, um, it will get lighter, but it will also be softer. And of course, anyone working on canvas, you, you just do the exact same thing we do with the paper. So. Don't be afraid to get a good old napkin in there. If your napkin picks up color, like yellow, like I've done here, I will fold it and just find a new spot. And then I want to keep a bit of a border today, I think. I think. So just staining with our acrylics today. And I hope you're enjoying this technique. It's one of my favorites for creating soft, soft colors. I've got some of this juicy orange kind of pooling in here and I could let that dry. I could hit it with my blow dryer directionally, like if I, or I could just drip it. So if I wanna let this wet orange drip down, I can, so you can move around as well. This is the kind of technique that you can really zone into. And while I do try to keep my tutorials to two to two and a half hours, I hope that you take some of these techniques, you know, with you into your own painting practice. And this is something that can look like a beautiful abstract painting just on its own. And you can really build it up in layers. Uh, like this and this is one way that when I do an abstract painting I start with something like this uh, and then I build it up and you could do this with any colors. This looks really particularly nice with the analogous color scheme which is three consecutive colors on the color wheel. So green into blue into purple, red into orange into yellow which is kind of what we've got here. We've got our red, orange, yellow. We've just really diluted our uh, analogous color scheme to make it look quite soft. It's beautiful. Excellent. Something else I find quite fun to do is splattering on our backgrounds. And the nice thing about splattering is we want it to be really quite wet as well. And I often splatter with my little number one round brush with this fellow here. And I just dip it. I'm gonna use some really vibrant, really wet pink. So I'm still into this really juicy, runny paint. I'm gonna add a little bit more red pigment in here. So it's this really, really runny stuff. And then to splatter paint, you just pull the bristles back and when I let this go, like boo, 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 it's gonna splatter everywhere. So I'm gonna angle that down here and right in the middle, kind of where a bee is gonna be, I think it can be great fun. It's just another way to add some texture. So just using watered down acrylic on paper. This is very similar to watercolor paper. The only difference is that acrylic paint has a polymer emulsion binder. So once this dries, it doesn't move. Whereas with acrylic paint, it's pigment, but the binder is just water. So essentially acrylic paint doesn't have a binder at all. So this was, or sorry, watercolor paint doesn't have a binder at all. So if I was using my watercolor paint, 
then I could just come back in with water and I could move it all around again. So watercolor painting isn't about building up layers. It's about strategically uh, painting typically one area at a time. And you can layer with watercolor, but it's not really the primary uh, technique that you use with watercolor, whereas with acrylic paint it is. I see Deborah tuning in. Hello and welcome. <laughs> she loves this color scheme together. I do too. Deb, I think it's really gorgeous. In summary, spring is just around the corner, so we're going to have flowers out soon. And for any of my gardener friends out there, if you love bees and pollinators, remember not to mow down your dandelions or those early you know, the flowers that people think are weeds are the first food for the bees which are so important to us and our food system and all of the beautiful things in the world like honey so leave your dandelions leave your clovers until other things start popping up in the garden that the bees can feed on okay so I hope you're progressing well with your water stained backgrounds I do want to start talking about our stencil work now. So I don't know about you, mine is still drying. So we can start talking stencil. So I typically build this up in two layers, starting with the wash and then applying the stencil. So for our stencil, I'm going to demonstrate a few techniques for you now. I'm just going to move the main demo over for a moment. And let's do a little bit of practice with our stencils. So this is just a smaller version of the same paper. And I'm going to lay one of my stencils down. Now when it comes to using a stencil, unlike when we use the bubble wrap, bubble wrap is just about pressing it on. And when you use bubble wrap, it's very much just like using a stamp. You're stamping where stencils get you a little bit more of a refined shape and it's the negative space instead of the, in the, the positive space and you're going to get a much more accurate um, look. Now one of my favorite things about the stencil is, you know, I got some almost see-through watery bits up here and then some more solid pixels, hives, hexagonal shapes down here. Now, with a stencil, it's very important that the water doesn't get under the rim. So if we were to use our juicy paint like this, it would be a mess. And I'm going to show you what it looks like when the paint bleeds through. So if I were to take, and I'm going to grab my number six round brush here. So if I were to take my round brush and go into some watery red and just leave it really watery, and I were to, and you could use a stencil brush, it's all good. If I were to just kind of run over the top of this with some really runny red to start. And then I move my stencil. You can see it's all bled together. Now, funnily enough, it bleeds heavier under where the hexagonal print is, so it still looks really cool. But let's talk about how to still use running liquidy paint while getting a clean stencil. So I like the look of how watered down this paint is and keeping it looking like watercolor, but we don't want it to bleed. So what we need here is our good friend, the paper towel. So we want to still be using our watery paint, but we want to be tapping our brush off. So I'm still going to go into this watery paint, but I'm going to tap until all of the color is mostly out of my brush, and my brush is just stained. So remember, this is the part that ran through. Now let's go ahead, and we're going to start coming over. And I'm going to get rid of most of that paint, I, I'm not using a stencil brush. I'm just coming kind of gently over top and a little bit in the middle of each cell. So I've got lots of control here. And here I'm going to come in with my honeycomb and still using a stain. Now I could make it even thinner and you could actually get your stencils to peter out this way. I'm going to just have water on my brush, barely any paint at all. So this is going to be even thinner and I can almost make it just kind of disappear this way. So have a beautiful fade out. 
So remember this corner here is bled together, but this corner here is where we tapped it off mostly on our napkin. So we actually get the lovely, lovely pattern. And that's using runny paint, which is something I often like to do at the edge. Let's talk about using really, really thick paint where we want it to be a little bit thicker. And if you're gonna be moving your stencil around, I typically just pick one way and then I'll line up a, color, a couple of the other holes and then I just lay it back down where I want it. Okay, so I'm gonna go into a bit more of a thick paint. I'm gonna take my square brush this time, my number six bright brush, and do please hold your stencil down firmly. And if you have a spare piece of paper and you wanna practice along with me, or if you're watching on the replay, I think it's quite fun to kind of practice before going over top of your, of your background that you've just made. So let's go now and get a little bit of an ombre. Let's go right into our light pink. And again, I'm using thicker paint, but I'm still tapping a lot of it off of my brush. And I'm just gonna come right in here, right over top. This is thick paint now. So not a lot of water in here. And I'm going to sweep right over top. Just doing your best to try to not lift the cells. You can take your stencil down, of course. So this is thicker paint. I'm going to make some orange here. We're going to do a little transition. Always just be tapping off. If you need to adjust your fingers, just go carefully. And feel free to tape down your cells. Do we want to add a few pure red ones? You can just go in, you can go right into the solid paint without any water. Just remember to tap off and just kind of slide over the top. You don't want to push it too much. We don't want to squish it in there. And the nice thing about a stencil is that you can really blend colors together just like this. So with your thick paint, you're going to come off and you're going to see a really, really hard edge. So here we've got these kind of bled out and I like to have these softer kind of bleeds of color, stains of colors mixed with some of these thicker, thicker colors onto the, the, the stencil. Now you can also overlap these, and this is where we can get into putting some of these purpley blues over top, which I did with my uh, stencil. So here's one I was just playing with a little bit earlier. I had done the pink, and then I laid the stencil over top, and I added some purple. I just lined it right up. So here was my practice with the bleeding color, so using too much water, but even when it bleeds, it tends to just fill in a little bit darker around where we have the cutout of the stencil. So don't be afraid of some bleed. It can actually look really pretty. You just want an all over hive pattern. If you're moving between colors like yellow and purple, which are complementary colors, I want you to wipe your stencil down with some paper towel Just wipe that stencil down with some paper towel. And now what way did I have my stencil here? So I'm gonna pull some purples now over top of these pinks. I've wiped all the colors off of here and I'm just gonna transition in between a couple colors. What way did I have you? No, I had you this way. Okay. So I just line it up loosely. Now if I wanted to tone these down and make them disappear, I would use white or even a peach color. Uh, I've got peach to pink to purple here and I think it's quite beautiful. But here I'm gonna go in for some purple. This is my prism violet mixed with some white. I'm gonna add water. I'm gonna tap most of it off. Hold your stencil down.
And so we can also layer colors when we use this stencil, which is nice. Now if you want to kind of peter out your pattern, you could just do some little half hexagons closer to the edge, or you could make it thinner with water. So we can get right on up in there. So this was layering kind of a peachy pink with some purple. Okay, so hopefully that was helpful and we can get right on into our backgrounds. Now, I don't know about you, my paper is flattened out, all except for the one corner that didn't have any paint on it there. I do have a big blob of red here. I can either wipe it off or dry it. I'm going to blast this with my blow dryer really quickly. I've got a few wet spots. So it's going to be loud just for one sec. When you're ready, it's time to stencil. Or bubble wrap, if you're bubble wrapping. So if you're bubble wrapping, you just paint the bubble wrap, press it on. I'm using a small stencil today, so it just covers part of my painting. You can overlap light areas with light color or dark areas with dark color. So this was a bubble wrap and I had really dark pink under here. And we went over it with light pink and peach. So the white sticks out against the dark background. And here it's light yellow with dark colors over top. So the whole pattern is just really quite fun. So you will be mindful of whether you want to lighten over your dark areas or darken over your light, light areas. I'm going to start over my yellow, a little bit of some darker yellow. Tapping off a lot of my excess color. And let's just fill in some of our cells. So I'm starting with some darker yellows and oranges over my pink. But please feel free to use whatever colors you just use today as an experiment. This kind of painting is so fun to do and you may just want to do more than one.
I'm just gently wiping off my stencil. I'm using my apron. <laughs> okay, and then we can carefully think about where we want to go next. There are larger stencils that cover the whole area. Uh, I just really wanted to try this one. I thought it was a nice, a nice size that would work for a small project as, as well as big ones. So it doesn't have to be perfect, but I'm going to line up in a similar orientation and think about what to try next. Loving it's summer, summer. <laughs> it's almost spring, which then will be almost summer. So some peachy colors over my darker pink, I think would be quite fun. My pink, my paper's a bit curled, so I'm just going to hold it down. If I was more patient, I would have taped it. But I wanted to do some holding uh, dripping as well, which is why I didn't tape it. I wanted to lift it up physically to show people who didn't have a blow dryer how to drip down. So here I'm using a light, a really, really light peach color. I'm going to try to pick some of this up. Ooh, I just altered my color. Yeah, this really, really light peachy color over the dark pink. I painted one of these just the other day, and it was one of those days where I was kind of rushing and I find with this kind of technique, some techniques suit rushing. Like if anyone did the wildflower tutorial with me, I think that one you could just not really think about and you can rush through and it ends up looking really cool. But with this, I find I really need to slow down and think about it and take my time. So I'm not going to rush right now. My partner Don and I are looking to move to move our house and studio and what a fun process that is. It is fun. It's fun and exciting, but holy stress balls. I need to paint me some honey tones. Decompress. Okay. So I've kept this whole thing really soft and watery and I've gotten some really fun peachy colors over the pink. So here, starting to build up our texture. If you want to get into some of these blues, so the way I did this was I thought about going kind of through the analogous colors, so colors next to each other. So yellow into orange into pinks and then into uh, reddish purples and then I used the tiniest little blue to get up into some bluish purples. So if you are, you know, feeling like you love purple and the purple, with the, especially this periwinkle purple, I think it just vibrates really quite beautifully with the yellow as uh, complementary colors and you, know, you could kind of see it here uh, if we had yellow at the tip, yellow to peach to pink to purple and if there's a bit more room even soft blues. So I hope you enjoy playing with this color today and let's keep going. Topping off the stencil here. You can work from the other direction as well. You don't have to you know, I could start up here, I could move over here. I want to see some of these pinky purples. Just line it up 
And by the way, if anyone has a stencil brush, this is a stencil brush. This is a small stencil brush. Um, they are flat on top. This is a small stencil brush. So because it's flat on top, you dip it in the paint and then instead of using the side of a brush, you use the top and you just tap on top. So if I was doing, you know, a text stencil or I'm using washes today, but if you wanted a really solid stencil, like you were stenciling on a name or a floral pattern on, you know, a headboard for a piece of furniture, you would really, really want to make sure you had a stencil brush that can be really uh, handy for getting really solid, solid stencil work. So I might come into pink mixed with purple to start. A pinky purple, this color. And I'm gonna tap off as I go. Now remember to be mindful of your background. So I know for my painting, I've got a really light background here so I can get away with using a little bit of a darker color. And eventually into some plain purples. And anytime we do a wash, we have to tap off all of the water, all of our water. This is just my purple color. When I did add the blue, I did it really, really slowly. I added just little bits. I hope you're enjoying the stencil part of the program. And you know, I if you do have areas where it drips through, um, so remember this was an area where I purposefully dripped it through and it was all solid. Never ever worry about stuff that happens when we're making art because we can always just let it dry and put something over top and those kinds of things that we think are accidents can actually work to our advantage and can end up looking really cool. So where this bled through, I put my stencil over top again and it was dark pink underneath. So I layered light pink on top and it ended up looking really cool. And if you're finding on your first few touches with the stencil, 
um, it's not going the way you like it, uh, just grab a little piece of paper or you know, hopefully you got a book. Because if you've got a book of paper, like a watercolor book, you can spend some time just uh, mucking around and playing with techniques. For larger areas of stenciling, like when I'm doing um, a bigger area, I often like to use sponges like these. And then you put the paint on the flat side, I'll tape my stencil down, and then I rub it over the whole thing and it makes it really quite quickly. So I'm doing a very special technique with the stencil here with the staining. This isn't the only way to do stencils. This is just a great one where we want to have soft watercolor like, like effects. Okay. Decisions, decisions. I'm loving how the purple looks almost cool, really, really cool next to these pinks. It almost looks bluish periwinkle and I haven't added any blue just yet. But what would it look like if we added some blue I'm going to do that in just a second. <clears throat> I'm going to pull up a few more of these purples and then see the blue hue is what we want to do. Oh. thing is we can actually layer purple over top of orange and yellow without it turning brown if we were to mix the colors mechanically like physically mix them together they turn brown and that's of course what we're going to do when it comes time to doing our B is we're going to make a beautiful brown for our B out of purple and yellow it's one of my favorite browns because it's, it's a golden golden brown. So I'm layering purple over peach. How fun. And I can see it, I blowed and got some drips earlier with my blow dryer. I can actually see it shining through, which is just really cool. So when we do our YouTube Live community is fairly new. I've been running tutorials for years over on my website uh, and Facebook Live. So when we put a tutorial on YouTube, it stays on YouTube. Uh, so you can enjoy it here whenever you would like to come back. And of course, if you would like to support uh, me, your artist, I also have uh, an option where you can tip just a few dollars to get a copy of this tutorial to keep. And it's and it's ad free. So we send you a link where you can watch it on your own time. But for anyone that just wants to come back and do it, uh, I wanna let you know that they're gonna be left up here for you to enjoy at your leisure. Yeah, Penny says, this is fun. Although this may all be my practice run and try doing it all again later. That's a really great way to work. And sometimes people ask me about painting and um, you know some of the best ways that to improve uh, skills or to paint what they see in their heads, which I think is things that we want to do. And always my best, my best piece of advice for anyone is just keep painting the things you like to paint again and again. So what makes me sad is if someone sits down and they you know, go to paint a tree and they go, well, that was hard and my tree doesn't look good. I'm not good at painting trees. So to get good at painting trees, I, I had to paint them so many times. And there's still so many things I have to learn about trees, even 20 odd years um, later. So none of us just sat, well, there's some things we may sit down and be naturally a bit better at than others. And that's going to be different for everyone. But for the stuff we really love doing, just do it again and again and again. And when we practice again and again, <clears throat> it's called doing a gesture. So sometimes, like if I want to paint an orca whale, I'll sit there and I'll look at pictures of whales that I like, and I'll get my 
sketch pad out and I'll scribble the same whale uh, 20 or 30 times. And you should see my rough work, my first copies of things. Um, you know, they're, it's, you're learning about the physical world through making marks. So it's not about it being good or bad. It's, um, it's about understanding shapes and, and doing that actually in action. So you're not just sitting there reading to learn about it. You're physically <clears throat> using your like, motor, motor control, I guess, to try to understand the shapes. And there's, our brains are all a little bit different. And so we all take in the world around us in different ways. This is my really curled up corner, so. I don't know. I'm really hold it down here. So now at the edges, even over the white parts, I like to add a few little bits. So hopefully you're coming along with your stenciling and just kind of tweaking up where you want things to be now. At this point in the stenciling, we should be able to go over some parts, like maybe I want to add some blue up here. Uh, look at your composition. I've got some areas around here and here I might want to do some layering on. I want us to spend at least another 10 minutes doing this. And then we have a solid hour to do our B together. Just use colors that make you happy. feeling pastels today or maybe you're feeling bright and bold I don't know maybe you busted out the neon colors I don't know if there's any beekeepers in the house I don't know about bees but I know a lot of birds and insects can actually see uh, ultraviolet light uh, frequencies and so the world uh, many colors that we see is just regular colors. Some insects actually see as if they were like neon and almost glowing. So seeing ultraviolet color spectrum, which would be really cool. So when we use these bright colors, at least that's what I was thinking about with the kind of bright pinks, it was like this is how a bee thinks about that Gerber daisy, which is very bright to us, but to him it would be just wild, wildly colorful. Jenny made a stencil out of cardstock. Very cool. It will definitely work. It will definitely work. Uh, if you use nice thick paper, it will work just fine. I've actually cut stencils out of just thick paper um, for classes. We did a, it was like a fairy in a field and <clears throat> I did a drawing of a fairy and I wanted to do it as a stencil art class. So I cut them out of paper, uh, Jenny, and it worked quite well. I'm going to go in for a little bit of very subtle periwinkle kind of bluish purple. So I'm going to use a little bit of light purple. This purple I have is very dark because in violet and dioxazine purple are very dark purple. So to make this blue, I'm just going to go just the tip into my phthalo and I'm going to mix it in with my purple and hopefully get a lovely soft like this color. Periwinkle blue, which again, periwinkle blue, look at it with this pale peachy orange. That's quite lovely. So blue and orange and purple and yellow, which we both have in this color combo, are complementary colors. So they do look quite lovely together. And I'm going to tap most of this off. 
just going to put a little bit in, be up here. Should use my other brush. Whenever I move from bluish purples and overlap my oranges, I try to be quite careful to wipe off my stencil so that I don't accidentally wipe down here. Don't want to get my blues, wet blue into my orange. Nilima said, my child is learning a lot of techniques from you and your tutorials. She loves painting. That's fantastic. I'm so happy to hear it. And I hope you share her finished B when you're done. So I want us to wrap up the stencil portion of our projects today. Sometimes I will come in with a little brush, like my number one round brush, and I'll go into some colors, and just like the bubble wrap wasn't hexagonal, but it read as hive texture, you can add some little dots in any color you want to fill in space in that kind of hive pattern. So if you wanted to kind of finish off some areas with some fun texture, you just pull in some dots around here. I just always thought this looked really cool. And again, this is another way you can approach abstract painting.
Let's get some texture. All right, I want you to finish up your pattern. As soon as we've got our backgrounds done and dry, we're going to start getting into the next part of the tutorial, which will be drying on and then painting in our honeybee. I like to paper dries a lot faster than canvas. So if to this point you have found painting on paper a little bit tricky, I hope this is a technique that you really love with using your paper uh, because it does work with the fact that the paper absorbs the paint and it dries a lot faster. Even if you gesso it, it's gonna dry much faster than on a canvas. So this is where the paper kind of works to our advantage. We're working with its natural absorbent quality. So I've got some little blobs I put on that are a little bit wet still. I'm going to hit this with my blow dryer and I want you to get your drawing utensil ready because we're going to put on our bee. This is going to be loud for just one minute. time. I hope you have your favorite painting beverage with you today. I've got a nice coffee with some honey. Thank you bees. Thank you bees. Do we have any apiarists in the house? My auntie had bees for a while and there's a lot of really wonderful uh, like organic honey farms and I really like organic farming because uh, they kind of work with sustaining wildlife and biodiversity and they don't use herbicides or pesticides when, you know, on, on the flowers and surrounding fields for their bees and for their honey, which is something that I, I really enjoy. A little local honey and some local coffee. Mm, honey coffee. Let's grab our drawing utensils and start talk about the drawing of our bee. Oh, well, there we go. So I've got my little sketchbook here. I just want to go over the basic anatomy of our bee before we begin. If you find it helpful, you can draw a line. You can draw a line the length of where you want your bee to be. Just keep it really soft. And we'll be drawing right over top of our, of our pattern in just a minute. So we have a line for the length of our bee. Now we, I like to start with the middle body, which is called the thorax. So you can see if this was a line straight down my bee and I cut it in half, the thorax, or the middle part of the body, is just above halfway. So if I were to cut my bee in half, I would want my body to be just about halfway up here. And it's almost a round shape. It's kind of like a squished oval. Now the queen bee, if you want to do a queen bee, you know, she's a little bit longer and she's got just that massive abdomen. So this is our thorax. And then the abdomen comes down. And if you have uh, you know, a bee that you really love, 
you know, if you're more into uh, bumblebees, you can change this up and you can work from a photograph of a bee. Uh, and that's what I did for, for this little fellow here. So we've got our thorax, the central part of the body. And then from here, we're going to draw a shape that comes out and down. It's almost like a teardrop, but it doesn't come to a full point. So it's going to be almost like a teardrop shape, but it's not going to point down at the stinger, which is at the little bum here. It's going to be a bit more rounded. So nice big abdomen. And my abdomen does come just a little tiny bit wider than the body, but not much wider. So I don't want to pull her way, you know, out here. Uh, if I were to have a little line coming up, you can see my abdomen comes just a little tiny bit wider than my middle body, than my thorax. I'm just going to connect the two like this. And from here, we'll be putting on our head, our little bee's head. So I usually just draw up and over. So it's almost like a little bee snowman. It's almost like a little bee snowman. I find a central line helps with symmetry. We want to give our bee some eyes. So we'll draw on some nice big eyes, circles or oval shapes that do protrude a little from the side of the head. Once we have the body, the head, and the, the eyes on, it's time to start thinking about our wings. Now, I took some liberties. So, you know, obviously, a bee's wings are teal, but I liked having some green because it almost brought in a whole rainbow, but a little bit of uh, red, orange, yellow. The teal is a bit of green and blue and purple. Um, but I had an actual beekeeper come in, and she brought some of her bees that had passed away. She brought in their body so we could use them as a live model and she actually painted her favorite queen bee um, so that was really wonderful to have them as models so I've got the wings coming out and they do have double set of wings and I've got them splayed out here so you can really see the anatomy of the bee and the wings kind of come from the, the thorax area here so I've got both sets of wings I've not left enough room on my page here to draw them both out but they would come up and off you would also have the wings kind of coming back more if you wanted to have the wings just one set coming down. But for this painting, I've got my upper wing. I've got to make it really small to fit on the page. I would do it a little bit bigger. It almost has a tip kind of like a butter knife. One. Two. And our lower wing. Three. And just symmetrical-ish is fine. So getting a little bit wider towards the ends. We've got our wings coming up. Now we also want to give our bee uh, six legs. The hind legs, the central legs, and we've got the front legs here. So all the legs come out of the thorax. <clears throat> but I had a bee where they came out and down. So they were kind of coming out from the the thorax and down like this. If you can fit all four as close to the uh, all six as close to the thorax as you can, that's great. So I usually start about the top of the ab abdomen for the lower legs, out and down, out and down. And you want to give kind of a little a little claw for the foot. So you've got a lower set of legs and. You know, they do come out at the bottom of the thorax, so top of the abdomen and bottom of the thorax area. Then I would like to have another set. This is the middle body legs coming out here, out and down. Kind of a little bit coming off, a little claw. The upper legs usually kind of come up, out and over, up out and over. Get a little claw. And then last but not least, some antenna. And you can really have fun with your antenna. You could have them come up and curl out and be really cute and stylish. I've got mine opening up <clears throat> almost like a bit of a cup, cup shape like this. But you know, you could have them both curling over. You could even have them swirl and it would look really cute. <clears throat> so then we've got our antenna. Now that's all I'm going to do for the drawing part. 
and fill the rest in with texture and color. So if you've got a white chalk pencil, I'm going to leave this here. If you've got a white chalk pencil, you can use that. So you want to give yourself a bit of a line for the, the length you want your body. I just do my B a little bit smaller. I want to make sure I've got enough room to have some mighty wings. <clears throat> to have some mighty wings. So I'm going to give myself a little, little thorax today. And this is where the chalk is nice. You don't have to erase. Abdomen. Head. Eyes. Antennae. Wings. Some big wings. And again, the tips I've got kind of like the shape of a butter knife, but you know, you could really stylize your tips there as well. Once you have your B sketched on, we're going to start filling it in. And I like to start with a little bit of an outline going around the B, just so we don't lose the shape. So we are done with our background colors. It's time for us to switch. So if you haven't already poured them, please pour for me now a little bit of yellow and purple. Those are the colors that we're going to use to create our dark yellows. We'll also need a little bit of black for the stripes in the eyes in our honeybees. If you want to do anything fun in the wings, like make them teal, <clears throat> we'll need some blue. And of course, we want a few little blobs of white for creating different tints of our yellow. So you can go ahead and pour those colors now. Go ahead and pour those colors now. I like to go just the tip with my little number one round brush into some water, just a little bit of water. And I'm gonna go into some black and I'm gonna come around my B and I'm not the wings, everything else. I'm just gonna start coming around. Here's my thorax. Which we will be filling in entirely in our black. We've got our eyeballs. Our head. Our head. You know, having a nice little brush like this is so fantastic for getting tiny lines. This is a little number one round. Penny says, I love my chalk pen that I bought from Walmart. It is great for things like this. Yes, I agree uh, wholeheartedly, Penny. I <clears throat> use my chalk pencil for everything. I see some people tuning in late. Hello and welcome. We're just getting our bees on. Now any of the parts that are, you know, black, black, we can fill in like the eyes and the thorax. I 
had a lady write in today and she goes, Jesse, in your demo, the legs come out of the abdomen. And it's the kind of thing that, you know, sometimes I take artistic liberties, we'll call them, and it just looked better. Like the legs actually came from there and, and they dangled down under the body, but not this far. And then she called me out on it. So I told her not to worry and that I would let everyone know the precise anatomy of the bee. So it's something you really, really love. You want to make sure that it's done correctly, right? Deborah said, what about the stinger? <laughs> yeah, the stinger would be, you know what, Deb, I don't know if they retract their their stingers or not. So um, I could not see the stinger, which comes out from the, the bum there. I couldn't see the stinger on the bee, but it's there. So fill in any of the black parts that will be totally black. And we're gonna do our legs, of course. These are the upper legs, the thorax, the middle part of the body. I really love learning about different creatures. So I always love when people give me fun, fun facts. I think artists are naturally prone to the feeling of wonder, especially when you're kind of painting the natural world. You tend to fall in love with the things that you paint sometimes while you're painting them, at least I do. My auntie right now is doing a portrait of my cat, which I'm so lucky for. She didn't really start painting seriously until she retired, but she's done nothing but paint. So she's painted more than most people I know uh, in, in just a year. And she's gotten quite good at it. And she was telling me about my cat and she goes, just like the little white dot on her nose. And I had actually never noticed this part of my cat who I cherish and love a great deal but because she was painting the cat she had her observation goggles on and she noticed this little white highlight on my cat's nostril that I had never noticed before so it just shows you the kind of uh, love uh, observation and close study that goes into uh, painters when they're working now I've pulled out a few little fuzzies in the thorax so took my little brush and I kind of pulled out a few little taps and made it an irregular line as opposed to a solid line so that I could make my bee start to look a little bit more on the fluffy side. Out comes the abdomen. pull on our legs, all of them as close to the thorax as we can if we want to be anatomically correct. So all coming out from the center. <clears throat> Sometimes, you know, you can just paint things to make them look good or you can paint them for scientific accuracy, but I'm going to have them all extending out from my thorax today. I want to impress, want to impress the beekeepers. So down, and out, and those middle legs, down, down, and they've got their little talons, their little claws, feet.
I also want us to paint in some stripes on our B. So I actually had four starting with a larger one. I had them getting a little bit smaller right down towards the stinger on the bottom. So there's a nice wide area of yellow and then we're gonna come down. So we can just paint in our stripes. You can have them straight or you can bend them ever so slightly. Show me your stripes. You can get some little fuzzy textures on the abdomen as well. Once we've got our black painted in, we'll want it to be nice and dry before we move on to filling in the yellow. So at this point in the painting, I like to move up and start filling in the wings. I want to make sure everyone that's painting along has got their black on though. Uh, we are doing really well for time. So when you have got the black on your B, if you could just give me a thumb up or tell me that you're ready in the comment section, then I'll know that we can move on together. And while I'm waiting for you to let me know that you've got your black on, I'm gonna show you what's coming up next for our projects. So I am on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, and I do tutorials on my website and you can watch them all from the website, uh, all of them. So coming up next on YouTube Live, we are going to get in the mood for summer and we are going to paint some patio lights at night. And you can do this, of course, this one's painted on paper. You could also do this one on canvas. This is a really fun summery project that we're going to be doing together. Then by special request, we will be doing a fun fairy mushroom firefly snail. We'll be doing a fairy mushroom firefly, firefly snail. This one is a website exclusive. So if you click the link that I'm going to put in this video after, it links to all the different places where we run our free, our free tutorials. So we'll be doing a cute little mushroom snail. If you're around tomorrow, we're gonna to be on Facebook Live and we're gonna be painting this blossoming tree. And I wanna show you two more because they're so fun and cute and spring is coming. These are done on canvas and they're just little squares. So we're gonna be painting a tiny little duck, little baby chick. And then this one is called Babbles. Babbles. <laughs> so some more fun free tutorials coming your way. 
I do see some thumbs in the comment section. So we're gonna get ready to move on to the next step of our painting, which will be painting in the wings. Now you can choose to do your wings in any color that you like. I've done them in sky blue, white, green, teal. So you could pick a color that you like. Uh, I, I did my outline in white, so you can choose to do a few different things. And I'll show you this one here. This one's quite large. Uh, this bee, <laughs> it's a big fat bee. So with this bee, I went with more of a powdery sky blue and then went around it in the dark color. Now, bee's wings are clear, so kind of an iridescent white color for a more natural look, and then using a gray or a dark brown for the structural lattice work in their wings. So you could choose to do a dark outline. Oh, this one is purple and white on the outlines. Okay, so many, many options for how you might like to do the wings. I'm gonna show you how to mix the teal color since it's in the demo painting. I want you to grab your small number six flat brush. That's your quarter inch square shape brush. Rinse off any color, tap it on your napkin, and I'm gonna mix a really, really light, light teal color here. So teal starts with a blue. <clears throat> Thalo blue is a really, really pigmented color. So go just the tip into that blue, grab just a little bit of it, and then let's mix it into an entire blob of white. Now you could stick with this color, this kind of powdery sky blue. I think this looks quite fantastic. I think this looks quite fantastic. To make this teal, you would add just the tiniest bit of yellow. So I'm going just the smallest little bit, barely any. If I add too much, it's gonna go quite green. So I'm gonna add just a little bit. And this is a really light teal. And the nice thing about having our palette so close as we can kind of see if this is the color that we, we would like in our painting. If you want it darker, <clears throat> just do it really slowly, grabbing the smallest bits of color as you go. So I just added a little bit more blue and I'm very much loving this particular color. Just like when we made some of the cells in our honeycomb pattern more see-through to make them look more runny and watercolor-like, I like to do the same thing with my wings. So I'm going to add water and I'm going to tap this paint off so my brush is really just stained with color and then I'm going to start painting in my wing. If your thorax is incredibly wet still, I want you to just let it dry for me. So I've got this kind of butter knife shape so it's not super pointy at the end. I've rounded it, but it does come to a bit of a tip. And when we add a bit of water to our paint, and again, this is a small space, so I'm using just a bit of color. I'm gonna smooth it in with my brush as it dries. This allows it to look a little bit see-through as well if you, if you like that look. So I can see some of my pattern below. And let's do all of our wings in this way. Let's do all of our wings in this way. Butter knife shape. And out, being careful not to push into my black too much here. to rotate my canvas when I'm working on it. Oh no, black. Upper wings and then we'll do our lower wings. I want to 
to make sure they come out to approximately the same length or if anything have the lower wings be a little bit on the smaller side and we're just going to work with little bits of pink because we're working in a little area and I love that we can see some of this honeycomb pattern through Everything about this project is kind of softness. Bright, bright and soft. Just like the season. I think teal and orangish peach are some of my favorite color combos. getting nice and textured. They are coming along buzzingly. You'll want to make sure our black is super dry because after this we're going to start layering in the yellow golden bee colors into our little buzzle bees. As soon as you've got your wings filled in, we're going to start mixing our dark yellow. So if you've been painting up a storm, you uh, likely know what the best color is to darken yellow. If you're new to painting, this is a wonderful trick for darkening yellow, and darkening any color. So you'll darken a color with its complementary, but especially yellow because most colors can also be made into shades with using black and retain their main undertone but yellow is the one color that takes on a totally different undertone because of the black itself, which almost always has a little bit of a blue tinge. So watch what happens. If I want a dark yellow that preserves its golden undertone and I mix it with black, here I'm gonna take some yellow. Ooh, I want a dark yellow. So I think I'll make a shade just like I would if I wanted to make dark blue or dark purple or dark red or dark green, I could use black. But if I take this little bit of black and mix it in, this color turns almost uh, green because most blacks have a blue undertone. So it doesn't retain its gold color uh, anymore. It has a lovely almost brassish bronze kind of color. But if we want to retain our golden undertone to our yellow, we're just going to add that purple in there. So I'm going to rinse the black off and you'll just see that I want to show you the difference of the ways to darken them. Now sometimes we want this color. Sometimes we want that greenish kind of gold. But I'm going to add now a little bit of purple into my yellow and I'm going to get a beautiful dark golden brown. So I've darkened my yellow using its complementary color and this is a darker version of yellow but it's golden as opposed to green and black will add green to both yellow and orange. So they're the two colors <clears throat> that are darkened really well with uh, purple. So darkening our color with its complementary. So I like having a bit of this dark golden yellow. So mixing the tiniest little bit of purple into my yellow and save some of your yellow. I'm getting excited about this color and I'm mixing a lot of it. Probably don't need this much. Do this tiny little bee. But we've got it ready and I want to show you the difference of mixing the dark yellow and the light yellow with white because yellow is another one of those colors that when you mix it with white it really changes <clears throat> the undertone again in ways that it doesn't with uh, other colors. So I'm going to mix some of, when I mix my dark yellow with white it really brightens it. It's just a little bit more muted. So this is still a lovely bright yellow. And if I mix my plain yellow with white, it's gonna be really vibrant. So this is just a bit of a more natural muted color. And of course, if I were to add 
white to my blackish yellow, it would still pick up those greenish tones. So some fun yellow color mixing. So I like to use these kind of two colors here to get the dark sunlights into our beak. And when we go to start filling them in, or her, maybe you did the queen, we will need uh, a nice little quarter inch flat brush or square shape brush. So I'm gonna come on in here. I'm gonna take some of my dark yellow and mix in the smallest amount of white. So the yellow is still dark, but the white's gonna help. The B is the one part we do wanna start blocking out the background. So mix yellow and purple together and then add a bit of white. So we've got this more of a mustardy yellow color, making sure your black is dry. And then let's start filling in our B. Now when it comes to the edge of that B, you can start pulling out some little, you know, lines to get some texture, like little fuzzes, so it's not just a straight line. And I'm definitely going to overlap the black. So I'm going to come in here, I'm going to start filling in with this base color and I can definitely see my black, uh, my background shining through. I'm going to come over my black outline, fuzz it up a little bit. So just instead of a flat edge, I'm just going to give it a little give some fun pulls down here. I want this to be a fairly darkish, darkish yellow in here. use a little bit of a lighter and brighter yellow to fill in the head. So some of the pure yellow mixed with white. They're still quite a vibrant color, so we want to keep it on the bright side. Continuing to come through our stripes with our dark golden yellow mixed with a little bit of white. Don't worry if you can see some of your background coming through. You can tap in here, pulling a little bit of the fuzz over the black. This is just our first coat, so we'll definitely get in some more. Stripes. So we've got our first coat in the yellow of the B. I 
I want us to pull a little highlight down the black stripes of the B. So where, if you can see, there's kind of a yellow highlight through the center of the black stripes of the B. And you know, they're a little bit uh, shiny down here. So they're gonna reflect some light at the height of, you know, they're a curved, they're a curved shape. So the light's hitting the curve and it's kind of reflecting a little bit off the top of that B. So I'm gonna take my number six flat brush into a little bit of the gold and yellow we mixed with some white in it. I'm gonna get it wet. I want this to be nice and see-through. And I'm gonna tap most of it off. So the, my brush is just stained with a little bit of this color. I want this to be really subtle. I'm just gonna pull a highlight right down right down the center We want to start adding a little bit of fuzz into the thorax, the middle body of the bee. So we're going to take our number six flat brush. And you see I've got some hairs that are kind of coming down this way and up towards the head. And then looking down, the bee's kind of quite furry here. So just some little taps. And we'll do this in the dark yellow first. And just like in the body here where we go through with some lighter yellow to pick up some texture of the fuzz. But let's use our dark golden yellow to create some texture first. You can even make it darker if you find that your golden yellow is still too light. So we could take some of our yellow and add it with a bit more purple. So even a color like this kind of dark golden purple brown can be really, really a lovely shadow color for our bees more of a golden brown. So I'm going to start pulling in some fuzz texture. And you know, this is a small area. So let's start with just a little paint and we can build it up if we need to. So I'm just going to tap along with my dark color. The shape's round, so it's kind of going to get straight in the middle And it's going to start to bend up. And then bend down. Some little taps across for some fur. And then we're going to get a little bit more of this fuzzy texture by holding our brush this way and having some little bits of that fur kind of come over top of the abdomen a bit. Maybe even some up kind of over the eyes, the fuzzy fuzzy bee. And we may choose to beef some of these up a little bit. go slow, brightening it as we want to. Let's make this little guy a fuzzy little guy. And just like there was a bit of a highlight down the middle of the bee's body, I'm going to come into this fuzzy part and where the light's hitting in the middle here, I'm just going to really beef up the texture a little bit more. Maybe around the edges a little, a little more fuzzy. So this is our first kind of dark layer.
When you're ready, we can start adding a little bit of a lighter layer. So I do this for you in far between. I just came through with a lighter yellow in between the stripes, adding a little bit of highlights into the fur up here, off the edges. You can make it furry for a, another layer. So the second pass is another layer. We're just brightening our yellows, getting them the color that we want them. And the two brushes that are great for this kind of detail work are our number six flat brush and our little number one round brush. So for some of those smaller hairs, and we can move into just our pure yellow mixed with white, or something kind of in between. And we could start adding some little taps in here, brightening it up. I like to go slowly with my brightening. I might use an even lighter yellow with some white up here. Some little tiny pulls. Oh, I've used a really, really, really light yellowish white there. Brighten the head of the bee. go right over top of those original dark outlines. So you can have your B be as bright or dark as you want. It's really going to depend on our background a lot, isn't it? So if you've got a really dark background, you may want to have a lighter B. If you've got a really light background, you may want to have a darker color B. And it's just whatever makes your B pop on your, on your painting. So, you know, this center area is furry. darker. There's some bits of light hitting the outside of the bee. So I tend to continue to lighten you know, as I go. Remember that light is really shining centrally on our bee. So we're going to focus a lot of our lighter colors. And you can tap the side of your brush or do little pulls. You can get in for a second layer of your dark color. You just want to build the bee until we're happy with the colors. For, for my tutorials, we draw everything together step by step. I really love, you know, teaching uh, drawing as well as painting skills, so I don't use stencils in my uh, tutorials. We'll all go step by step together and draw them. It makes it so much easier the next time we go to do a painting when we draw them on ourselves. So that's the way I like to do uh, my tutorials is to have us have us draw them on together. And even if it feels funny at first, the more we draw, the faster we become uh, 
more confident with our drawing. So we use a, uh, a stencil for the honeycomb and I just used any old stencil that I found on Amazon and then we drew our bee on together. So building up our colors, add a little bit more of a highlight in the head here. Now I love getting a little reflection in the bee's eye. So I actually did it in two parts here. So I went in with a little bit of my uh, medium yellow, so the dark yellow we mix with purple that has a little bit of white in it. And then I did a tiny little white dot right in there. And with it up close, you can see there's some little tiny white highlights that we'll do afterwards. Let's get the highlights in our eyes for now. And then we'll go on and we will start pulling in some of the structural uh, veiny texture in the wings. So to do the highlight in the eye, we're going to use a little bit of this medium yellow here. It does have a little bit of white in it. And let's just come into our eyes in the, about the same spot in each one. Use just a little bit of paint for me. Sometimes I'll even dab it with my finger to spread the paint out and make it a bit more see-through. So we are going to start with a little bit of yellow. And then we're going to go just the tip into some white and then And we're going to put a white highlight in there as well. Mm. There we go. It's a little bright in the center. A little darker around the edges. Oh, we're in the white. So as long as your yellow is dry, you can pull a few little white pulls down the top. Maybe a couple on the bottom. Once we've got our bees body highlighted, some reflections in the eyes, and I just pulled a few light taps. Remember that light's shining centrally. So where we put our, our light yellow through the center of the stripes, a little bit of white. Now it's time to do the lattice work on the wings. And remember, you could go and do it in white. So for these wings, I outline them in a lovely purple color. And then I did the lattice work in the wings in white. You could also do the lattice work color in a darker color if you like. If you have metallic paints or iridescent paints, they would look really uh, gorgeous in the wings of our bee. So think about how you want to pull in the color of your bee. But we're going to pull in these shapes and they're very much like the segments inside of an orange. They're like really soft diamond shapes. 
If you've never paint these, painted these kinds of shapes before, you can go ahead and sketch it out first with your pencil or your uh, chalk pencil. They're very much like soft diamond shapes, but I'm going to come in here and I'm going to add a little bit of water to my paint. Now if we're doing curved lines like this, we want to use our little number one round brush. We want to use our little number one round brush. And I'm using soft body paint, which means it's quite runny in nature. But if you're using a heavy body paint, like a Galleria, a, a, the Windsor Newton, or the Golden, or the Liquitex heavy body, you'll need to add a bit more water to your paint to get it to flow in a curved line for you. So I like to do these sort of soft diamond shapes coming up with my runny white. So here's one shape. Kind of just pulls together. Then I'm going to come off of here and I'm going to do another shape. And then I'm going to do another one coming out here. So we get this kind of lattice work. This is the structure for the bee's wings. And I want us to do this in all of the wings. So again, you know, if we're doing our side wing here. So this reminds me of painting oranges and these soft, soft diamond shapes in the center of a juicy orange. Now I've outlined my wings in white here. I often choose to outline them in a darker color but this painting is one where we have to make a lot of different color decisions based upon our own background and our own preferences for contrast. We are our own color architects. We will be coming up to the last part of our painting after this. So I wanted to know if anyone had any questions for me. Uh, I am here for you, of course. If you have any questions about this painting uh, while I'm here, please feel free to ask in the comments section. So we've got these soft shapes in the wings. Now different whites can be a little bit more see-through. The white I'm using is a student grade paint so it is quite see-through. So I will need to do two coats on this. If I'm using my more uh, artist brand paint like the, I love the Windsor Newton white, it's like my current favorite white, I usually only need to do uh, one coat. But I do like how fluid these paints are so I chose to use these ones today. 
Now as a last minute tweaky deaky, I always think it's good to stop and step back from your painting and see if you want to add anything else on here. So I did go around my wings here with some dark purple. Let me do that just to help separate them. I see Brittany says, I painted on sketchbook paper because it's what I had. Is it going to stay worked? No, as you can see, my paper is actually quite a bit more worked today. Um, and when I work on paper, and I do work in a sketchbook often, that's only 110 pounds, and it works a great deal. So the great thing about paper, now my paper is curling in a little bit more, so what I'll do after the class today is I'll put it upside down, make sure it's really, really dry, and then press it under some really heavy books, and it will flatten out for you. And I usually press it overnight, so, you know, if you go to bed uh, tonight, stick it under those books, leave it all day tomorrow, and it's going to flatten right out for you, uh, Brittany. grab some dark kind of purplish red. I'm going to add a little bit of white to it. I'm going to show you what it looks like. Now I think this looks really quite natural, but outlining and just adding some extra color in here is always quite fun. So I'm going to add a little purple line around my wing. my brush control today. I'm all wobbly. There we go. Come here you. says, I use pearlescent white wings. What would you suggest for the lines? That will depend on your background color. So you could go with either, um, if, it's a, if it shows the background through, um, you could actually still use pure white that's really solid on top. Or if you wanted a darker look, you could use, um, I like to use sometimes just my really dark purplish gold color or purple color or blue color. So you can really have fun with the color in your wings it, and it depends on whether you want a more natural look. For a more natural look, a neutral color like brown or gray, but I mean we've got neon honeycombs in the background so for most of us probably scientific illustration is not in the cards for this project. Penny says, how asleep can we do the veins and the wings? Penny, can you repeat that question for me? I think you got auto auto corrected. So you can see the difference between having that little purple outline or leaving them. I really liked them just uh, without the outline, but I wanted to show you what that could do, and it, that might work really well for your, for your background today. My background is quite a bit lighter on this painting, so having the outline really helped pop the wings out. My background's quite dark here, so the wings were standing out naturally on their own. You don't have to do this part with the purple. I'm just showing you some options. In this little bee, I pulled some of the fuzzy uh, dark B color, the dark golden yellow, into the legs as well. 
But other than that, this is the last official step to our honeybee painting today. If you don't have any more questions, I am going to sign off for the evening. I hope you enjoy painting these honeybees with me today. And until next time, I hope you have a fantastic day for the rest of it. Take care, everyone. Bye.